Hi everyone, I'm here today to talk to you about my favourite books of 2019. According to Goodreads, I read 103 books last year, but that's not quite accurate because it was my last year judging the Somerset Mom Award. So I think I read about 150 books. There were just some titles I couldn't catalogue as I was judging the prize. But today I've picked my favourite books out of all of those books. I have 15 here to talk to you about and I've put them in a rough order. All of the books, apart from my favourite book of the year, would probably change places a little bit on any given day, but I do have one standout book of 2019 that I love, love, love with all my heart. I will link all of the books in the description box down below if you would like to go and find out more about them, and I would love to know what your favourite books of last year were in the comments section down below. So let's go roughly from my least favourite favourite to my most favourite favourite. Number 15 is this one here called Becoming Unbecoming by Una and this is a graphic memoir. This book really surprised me and by that I mean when I was reading it I hadn't realised just how much it had taken hold of me, how much it had got under my skin until towards the end of the book. I was gonna say it's subtle, it's it's not, it could because it's very unflinching and honest and brutal, but the way that it's told is quite subtle in that it can slowly weave all of these narratives together and it's not until the end that you realise what a magnificent thing she has done. As I said, this is a graphic memoir, it's set in 1977, Una is her pen name, she grew up in Yorkshire at the time of the Yorkshire Ripper, Una had been sexually assaulted herself, though not by the Yorkshire Ripper, and she was watching the way that his crimes were being reported in the press, and there are extracts from those reports in this book. The narrative surrounding violence against women was so warped. So you think at first that you're getting her personal story, but then as I said, it expands into something so much bigger than that, not that her personal story isn't itself extremely important. It's like she's building her own court case, and by the end, you can't help but just stand up and applaud what she's done. So if you haven't read this book, I would really recommend it. I have been saying when I've been recommending it to people that I would particularly recommend it to those who enjoyed or wanted to read um, the nonfiction book five about the women who Jack the Ripper murdered, um, which I want to get to in 2020 because I think both of these books set out to do a similar thing, just in a very different way. The next book on my favourites list is this one here called Lullaby by Leila Slimani and this is translated from the French by Sam Taylor. This one I'm including in my favourites because it is very beautifully written, it is a subtle crime thriller and you really get inside the head of this nanny. It's, it's more a character study with very deeply disturbing, I was going to say undertones, overtones, I suppose if you'd like something like The Dumb House by John Burnside, which if you've been here a while, you know I do, then you'll probably enjoy this as well. So Miriam is a French Moroccan lawyer and she decides to go back to work after having two children and she and her husband find this woman, Louise, who will look after her children. And at the beginning, we read about Louise murdering these children. So this book is about the lead up to that. As I said, it is a character study. It's about what Louise is thinking. And I just, basically inhaled this book. There are a few things that I think made me love this book even more. I have read other books that Sam Taylor has translated and adored them. I think if you're a translator, you also need to be a fantastic writer as well, and Sam Taylor is definitely that. I think I had also, at the point that I read this, just finished watching Killing Eve, which I loved and maybe I transferred some of my love into this book. It's so hard to work out why we end up loving a certain thing. Sometimes the stars just align and it's a bit of a, you know, a perfect time to be picking up a book and I think that's the case for this one. It also started my love of reading crime slash thrillers. I read a lot of them after reading this and I went out I think it was, it was maybe not the next day, but the day after that to buy her next book, Adele, because I needed to read more of her writing. It's not my favorite, favorite book of the year, but I think it definitely deserves a space on this list. Next on my list, we have Flesh by Mary Jean Chan, and this is a poetry collection. Mary Jean Chan grew up in Hong Kong and now lives in London. The title of this book is a homonym. So in French, Flesh 
is a move that's used in fencing that is quite aggressive but obviously it also sounds exactly like the English word flesh and a lot of this collection whilst touching on fencing and also arguing and fighting is to do with the body and queerness. It is the meeting point of all of these things and it's also about being bilingual as well and I mean that in two different senses so the literal sense so speaking Chinese and also speaking English and speaking those languages in different areas of your life and she uses Chinese letters throughout this collection to illustrate that in a similar way to Raymond Antrobus using British Sign Language in his collection The Perseverance but it's also about speaking and navigating different forms of language with regard to who you are. So being in a space where you can talk about being queer with people who accept you and then being in a space with people who either don't know you're queer or do but are not okay with it. So many poems in this stood out for me and I have made a video where I have dissected one of my favourites. So I'll link that in the description box down below. This is a stunning collection and I urge you to pick it up. Next on my list, I have two that kind of go hand in hand, even though they're very different. I just wanted to highlight one Persephone book, really, because I had fallen in love with reading Persephone books again this year. I didn't love every single one that I read, but I particularly loved these two, and I couldn't choose which one to mention as a, a representation of all of them. So I'm gonna mention both. So this is Doreen by Barbara Noble. It is about a young girl called Doreen who was evacuated during the Second World War. And it's about the relationship she has with her mother who stays behind in London as a cleaner and the couple that she's sent to in the countryside who always wanted to have a child and never had one. And it almost becomes a bit like a custody battle and they're vying for her affections in different ways. And I never read an evacuation novel like that. And to be honest, I don't think I'd ever really considered that. What if you move somewhere and you loved it more than the place that you left behind. So yeah, I just really enjoyed this. It felt like a, a warm hug. The second Persephone book that made my list is this one. And if you're confused by me mentioning Persephone, that's the publisher. They publish forgotten classics, mainly written by women. I'll link their website down below. So the second book of theirs that made this list was Daddy's Gone Hunting by Penelope Mortimer. This was set in and written during the 1950s. It's about a housewife called Ruth who discovers that her 18 year old daughter, Angela, has fallen and pregnant and isn't happy about that. It's one of the only books set during this time and written during this time that discusses abortion in the way that it is discussed in this novel in that it should be a viable option for women, it should be something that they're able to talk about and it shouldn't be illegal, which it is in this book. It also discusses the complex emotions surrounding abortion. So Ruth, the mother, when she fell pregnant with Angela when she was 16, 17, she wanted to have these conversations with people, but nobody would open up and speak to her about it. And she doesn't regret having her daughter, but she does lament the lack of options that she has. I found this book so refreshing and I would very much recommend it if you're looking to pick up a Persephone classic. The next book on my favourites list is Convenience Store Woman by Siaka Murata and this is translated from the Japanese by Ginny Tapley Tegmori. It is the 10th novel by Siaka Murata but the first to be translated into English. We'll have more of her work coming in 2020 which I'm really looking forward to. This, even though it is small, it is mighty, it is about a woman called Kiko who works at a convenience store and she enjoys working there because she finds it hard to understand why people act the way they do and her job literally gives her a manual on how to communicate with people and she finds that extremely comforting. Takiko society is one ever-changing mass, blurry at the edges. She says that all babies are like stray cats, all people are like cattle. She feels as though she is a piece of society's software that is being rewritten all of the time depending on who she happens to be interacting with and she calls this being infected. It's essentially about feeling foreign in your own country and when Kiko first came across the convenience store and she saw it all lit up, she thought it looked like an aquarium. So taking that imagery and the way that Sayaka Murata talks about the convenience store, we can see how she's using it to show how stores are microcosms for society. And Kiko is our scientist who is 
studying the society for us and telling us about it in her own words. I thought that it was wonderful. I know so many people have read this, but if you haven't picked it up, it is well worth your time. Next on my favourites list is Tipping the Velvet by Sarah Waters. And like with Lullaby and the Persephone books, this is a representation of more than just Tipping the Velvet. This being on my list is a representation of Sarah Waters as a whole, because 2019 was the year that I read her for the first time, which sounds ridiculous now that I say it. So many people had recommended her to me in the past. So many people talk about her books. She's one of those authors I almost feel like I have read via osmosis or something because she's talked about it so much, but obviously I had not. This was the first book of hers that I read. I read three and a half last year. I read Tipping the Velvet, The Paying Guests, Night Watch, and I am halfway through The Little Stranger at the moment. And this is my favorite out of the four. I've listened to all of them on audiobook and I would highly recommend listening to them on audio because they are character driven and atmospheric and quite slow paced. Therefore, I think they work very well on audiobook. Tipping the Velvet is about Nan, who is an oyster girl. She lives in Whitstable with her family and she falls head over heels in love with Kitty, who is a masher. So she goes onto stage dressed as a man. That is her act. And then the two of them decide to team up and have an act together. That's the very beginning of the book. They move to London. The novel goes from there. It's very Dickensian in style. You can predict a lot of the plot that's going to happen because it's laid out so beautifully. It does feel like you're reading a serialised novel, which is why I say it's quite Dickensian. However, this is everything that I would love from Dickens that I never seem to get. So if, like me, you have felt let down by Dickens, but you would like atmospheric Victorian books with great female characters and queer representation, here you go. Enjoy this book. I loved it. The next book on my favourites list is Remarkable Creatures by Tracy Chevalier. I also really enjoyed her latest book, which is called A Single Thread, which came out in September. So if you haven't read that yet, I also recommend it. But out of the two, this was my favourite that I read in 2019. This is a novel about Mary Anning, who was a real life person who was born in 1799. She was struck by lightning when she was little. The person who was holding her died, as did the people surrounding her, but she survived and she grew up to be a budding paleontologist. She discovered some of the most important fossils on Lyme Regis Beach, including the ichthyosaur. She sold her fossils to people such as William Buckland and she wasn't really given credit for her work at all. By the time her fossils reached the societies or the museums where they were being displayed, she was mostly forgotten about. So this book seeks to give her back the credit that she deserves. And it also examines her friendship with a woman called Elizabeth Philpott, who also enjoyed searching for fossils. It discusses class as, as well as friendship and science. What I love about Tracy Chevalier's novels, apart from everything, is that you leave having learned so much, but you're learning it in a way that doesn't feel like you're learning. <laughs> she weaves fact and fiction together so beautifully, is what I mean, and I applaud that very, very much. Next on my favourites list is An American Marriage by Tayari Jones. This was my favourite novel from the 2019 Women's Prize for Fiction shortlist, and it was the winner as well, which I was thrilled about. This is a deliberately chaotic novel that will make you feel all of the things. It's about a married couple called Celestial and Roy. When the book opens, they'd be married about a year. They love each other very much, but they don't have the best relationship. After an argument, Roy leaves the motel room that they're staying in to go and get some ice. On the way back, he discovers a woman who needs his help, so he helps her because he's a decent guy. Then later that night, that woman is assaulted, and when the police come, she identifies her assailant as Roy. We know he did not commit this crime, but the police take him away and later the court system send him down. This is about what it's like being at the mercy of the racist judicial system in the States. And whilst this novel is set in the present day, it fantastically mirrors the characters and events of If Beale Street Could Talk, which is James Baldwin's 1974 novel. The characters make different decisions, but ultimately find themselves in the same place to highlight how little has changed in America when we're talking about race and prison. Because Roy is sent down, most of this novel is set with him in prison and it's an epistolary novel, so most of it is letters going back and forth between Celestial and Roy. It is intentionally messy and heartbreaking. It is the book that stayed with me the longest 
and moved me the most out of all of the women's prize shortlisted books from last year. Next on my favourites list is a book that refuses to conform to one genre. This is Mrs Gaskell and Me by Nell Stevens. It is in part about Mrs Gaskell who Nell is researching and she's talking about a man that she was in love with outside of her marriage and it's also her talking about her researching Mrs Gaskell and her life trying to figure out what she wants to do with her life after her studies, what she wants to write about in general, and how to reconcile with the fact that she's in love with someone who lives in another country called Max. It is about trying to find yourself, not just in others and searching for connections with people who are alive, but trying to find yourself in history and trying to find the human aspects of people in an academic way. If you like, Sally Rooney, I think you'll really like this. And there's something about this that also reminds me of Greta Gerwig. So if you like those two people, then I'm pretty sure that you will love this. I thought that it was delightful. Another book that was delightful was Elizabeth's Lists by Lula Ellender. And I toyed about where to put this because I read this very recently and sometimes books either fade away or they you know you remember them more vividly after a certain period of time but I'm going to be brave and put this in my favorites list because I adored it. This is a non-fiction book where Lula is looking at the life of her grandmother who's called Elizabeth. Lula was given a book of lists that Elizabeth had written by her mother. Lula also had access to Elizabeth's diaries so using both the diaries and the lists she's tried to write a book about her life but like with Mrs Gaskell and me it's not just about Elizabeth's life it's about Lula's journey in discovering who Elizabeth was and talking about losing her mother at the same time that she's discovering her grandmother. Elizabeth was a fascinating person she grew up in 1930s China her father was a British ambassador she was shot in the forehead by the Japanese rescued by a man who later became her husband and was a British diplomat so she later traveled all around the world as well she lived in Rio she lived in Lebanon she lived in Madrid under Franco's regime she also lived in the UK it's about her relationship with her brother which was particularly poignant and devastating and it's about her mental health as well these lists are lists that she made to try and organize her mind when she felt like she was losing control as well as just organizing her life in general but it was a coping mechanism for her this book it, I read it in about I think it was just over a day if I hadn't desperately needed to go to bed I would have stayed up and finished it I just couldn't help but read on and read on and that doesn't happen so much with me anymore often I will read a little bit put it down um, during commute etc I tend to read in snippets but this was one book that I couldn't leave for a prolonged amount of time. Next up is also a book that I read recently and this is Not Here by Human Win and this is the second poetry collection that made my favourites list this year. Not Here is an unearthing and the first poem in this collection says I know I know it sounds strange, climbing inside a boy and crawling out into yesterday's light, but that's something that the speaker has to do. He has to go back and explore all of these painful things in order, as he says, to become a braver kind of meat. The main relationship that is discussed in this book is between the speaker and his mother, who is absolutely not okay with the fact that he is gay, and he's trying to reconcile that hurt with the fact that he loves her deeply, and how painful it is for her to reject that part of his identity, and then for him to say well I can't cut you out of my life because so much of my identity is tied up in who you are. It's a grieving for relationships of all different kinds um, and it's also about people that he's lost literally as well. There is a devastating line in one poem that says your funeral was like a party you forgot to attend. It wasn't the same without you. I found this book so incredibly moving and I would very much recommend it if you haven't read it yet. The next book on my favourites is actually a series of books and I wasn't sure where to put them but I'm putting them here because they just have been a joy to read. They are not the best written books that I read this year but they, as I said, brought me so much joy. This is the Frida Klein series by Nikki French. 
Frida Klein is a psychologist and this is a series of books that follow, I was going to say a week in her life, they don't, they, they're named after days of the week but they, they follow several years of her life. The first one is called Blue Monday and it's not just about her but it's about her friends and the people in the police force that she gets to meet. Each book deals with one particular case but there is an overarching storyline to all of these books that comes to a head right at the end of the series. They kept me gripped. I guessed a lot of the twists and turns but not all of them so they also surprised me. I think that's what you want in a thriller, right? You want to be able to guess some of it but you also want to be shocked and uh, I love a good reveal or a good twist and it had plenty of those. I listened to them on audio, they're narrated by Beth Chalmers and I think they work particularly well on audio so if you're looking for a new crime series, crime thriller series to sink your teeth into then please do give them a go. We're down to the final two. Number two on my list is Spring by Ali Smith. This is part of her seasonal quartet where she's writing novels that are very of the moment reflecting our current political climate. They have different characters but they are thematically linked because of the project that she has set out to do. This one is the third one. You don't have to read them in order but I would recommend all of them because I think that they are all brilliant. This particular one is about art. It's about a man who has recently lost his best friend. It's about how much she loved Catherine Mansfield and looked into her life and how people had fictionalized her life so it's where fiction and fact meet it's also about borders and refugees it's about wordplay and propaganda and how people play with narrative and the power that that holds i've done a whole review of this for toast which i will link in the description box down below because it is a book that is so much about theme and imagery i think it's easier to to write about it than to speak about it because plot is not the thing that holds it together and um, so go and read that review if you would like to understand the book more fully. My favourite book of the year is probably no surprise to any of you and that is Lanny by Max Porter. I was very nervous to read this because I adored Grief as a Thing with Feathers so much which was Max's first book, this is his second and I just didn't know where he could go from there but it's even better. It's even better than Grief is a Thing with Feathers and that's definitely not something that I thought I would say going into it because as I said I loved Grief so much. This is about a family that live in a small town on the commuter belt outside of London. The dad commutes into London every day. The mother is writing questionable crime novels that she doesn't want her son Lanny to see who is left to run around the village. He loves getting his fingers in the soil, he loves nature and he's made friends with an artist who lives up the road called Pete who has started teaching him how to draw. Or actually Pete would say he's not teaching him how to draw, he's just talking to him about art because he doesn't think that young boys should be told what to do, he just thinks that they should be communicated with. Tying all of these threads together is Papa Toothwort, dead Papa Toothwort, who is a manifestation of everything that he has ever overheard and everything that he's seen people do. He is the best and the worst of humanity, this mythical figure that creeps through the village like a gigantic green man and he's fallen in love with Lanny. He loves the way that Lanny talks, he loves his positivity and dead Papa Toothwort, as, as I said, all of the horribleness of humanity, all of its prejudices, all of its pessimism is drawn to the innocence of Lanny and it wants to feed on it. I read this book in book form first then I listen to it again as an audio because like with Grief is a Thing with Feathers it's a set out almost like a play. The second section of the book is a chorus of voices. I would recommend reading it in book form first but I would so recommend revisiting it in audio book form. I also saw Max and some actors read most of this book at the South Bank which was a wonderful experience. They had a band too so if that is ever performed again and you can get the chance to go and see it then please go and see it. I also reviewed this in Full for Toast so I'll link my review in the description box down below if you would like to go and find out 
basically just if you want to read more about me gushing about how much I love this book then you can head over to that review and read more. Those are my 15 favourite books of 2019 as I mentioned they're all linked down below if you would like to go and check them out. Have you read any of these? Would you like to now you've heard me gush about them in this video please let me know in a comment down below and also let me know what your favorite books of 2019 were as well because i would love to know i will be back with another video soon i hope you're having a great start to the week lots of bookish love